Hello guys and welcome back. For the first time on the channel, I want to present you Banco Gambit with the black piece. We're talking about a very nice opening for black with lots of counter opportunities. There is only one, um, I'd say, drawback of this opening. You can only play if they play d4, knight f6, c4. Unfortunately, you can't play Banco if they go for ready opening. Okay, here and there, there are certain lines where you can still play c5 and b5, but that's almost impossible. You can play against English opening. And that's why Banco uh, players are kind of limited. They can always use Banco against d4 and c4, and they're not supposed to use it uh, against other variations. Anyways, hopefully you're going to enjoy this uh, lecture. Uh, there is a new background here so we're gonna be seeing a little bit more of this in the future and uh, keep in mind uh, from recently I just started um, doing uh, regular streams on Chesbra channel with Dylan and those are for fun and especially a serious one with Grandmaster Eric Hansen for Blitz Rapid and Bullet Practice uh, okay, guys, uh, let's get started with this one and enjoy the lecture. What's the Banco Gambit and how does it arise? So after d4, knight f6, c4, c5, d5, that's uh, one more drawback of the Banco Gambit. It cannot be played if they play, for example, knight f3. But if you want my recommendation what to do against knight f3, and maybe we can do it in some of the future videos, I like... Kasparov's approach from his, let's call it childhood, where he took on d4, played e5, and went for the gambit with d5. I'm not saying that it's the most popular or most correct and sound way of playing this opening, but it's certainly very interesting for black. After d5, you just go with b5, and da 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 da, we have Banco Gambit. Uh, Banco Gambit, I was checking some historical details. Paul Banco was on regular basis and with great results used this b5 move, but he wasn't the first one who played it. I found that Stoltz back to 1933 played for the first time b5 and three years after some guy from Lithuania, Valtanis, played three games and even won all those three games with the black pieces. Although Benko was the most famous guy who played this opening and that's why they called it after him. Although, in the title of this lecture, you see Perunovic line. No, you are completely wrong. If you think it's me, it's Grandmaster Miloš Perunovic, a Serbian a national team member for the last 20 years, extremely strong GM. And the guy who came up with some very interesting lines uh, in the Banco Gambit. Hopefully, you're just going to enjoy the analysis. Mm. I've been using this uh, Banco Gambit for a couple of years. Uh, and I always remember when I was bragging around, like saying, I am the master of Banco. And then somebody told me, what do you mean master by Banco? Uh, you, all you have to do is to sack the pawn, put both of your uh, rooks on the A and B files, put a queen on A5, bishop on A6, and let's go, claim some compensation. And when you put it like that, it really sounds like that. But you just have to know one thing, that Perunovic came up with one very interesting variation, and that is really one of his innovations in the Banco Gambit. So let me just show you what it's all about. Here we won't analyze those e3 stuff and so many other things if you like this lecture if you find it good if you find it a uh, quality enough uh, i really hope that i can do like a series on uh, banco gambit lectures with a fourth move by Bla by white e3 knight c3 knight f3 e4 whatever but the thing is after a c takes b5 you just go with a6 and here they just take on a6, we're getting the main line, and that Perunovic line can only happen if you play g6. 
that's very interesting not to take the pawn on a6, to delay capturing the pawn on a6, and to go for something else. To go for what? To go for um, simply delay of taking that pawn on a6. So what does it mean? It means that after b takes a6, you just have to go with g6. If you want to play the line that I'm about to show you. Uh, if bishop a6, that's a classic way of playing Banco Gambit, and I found equally a big number of games with g6 and bishop a6. Although, when you put it on the scale and uh, check what top players do, you just realize that the top players play like 5% of the games with bishop a6 and 95% of the games with g6. And now you're probably wondering, so what's a big deal? What's, what's the difference? Uh, what's so special about not taking and delaying to take on a6? So let me just show you. After a bishop takes a6, uh, you just have to know for one thing. So uh, bishop uh, takes a6 and they just go with knight c3. When you go with g6, you just have to be ready for the line with e4. Simply saying, when you decided to capture by bishop on f1, you did something uh, and you kind of committed yourself. Uh, the thing is, now you have to take on f1. King takes f1, d6. For example, I'll always remember my mistake here uh, with white pieces. I played one tournament game against a uh, strong I am from Serbia, Marinkovic Ivan, who always used to play Banco Gambit with lots of uh, great results. And here I first played knight f3 and he used Carlsen's idea, queen c8, which is aimed again g3 and king g2 because of some queen h3 ideas, support some h5 and h4 ideas by black. And he didn't allow me to play like this. So best uh, and the most accurate uh, order of moves is g3, bishop g7, king g2, castles, knight f3, knight bd7, and boom, a4. And now you're just wondering why once again I came up with this boom thing. Uh, back to 2012 and Bill tournament in Switzerland. Uh, at that time, one of the uh, highest rated players in the world. And nowadays the second highest rated guy in the world after Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura went for this move with A4 with the white pieces. He played it against Bolagan and won an amazing game. Right after that, literally everyone started to play this a4 and i remember when i'm teaching my students with white pieces how to play against banco this is how i teach them to play play a4 and kill your opponent you know what's interesting you can find all kinds of top names playing with the black pieces like this but once they face a4 which is idea to push that one to play rook a3 to play knight b5 to play some queen c2 b3 bishop b2 to exchange the dark square bishops then you just realize all the difficulties of the move a4 by white and now you're thinking like why is he showing us this because you're not supposed to play bishop a6 guys because you're just taking a huge risk of facing Nakamura's line with 12th move a4. That's why we have to go with g6 and we gotta go with Milos Perunovic variation with uh, queen a5, but I'll show you everything and a little bit more about that variation a little bit later. So after g6, knight c3, bishop g7, <clears throat> there we go. Here, uh, white literally has two kinds of plans to go with e4 or to play g3 type of games. If they go for g3, I gotta show you a very interesting clash between Gukesh and Carlsen and Grandmaster Majorov and Perunovic, uh, where Perunovic in Portugal won. So after g3 castles, bishop g2, he wants to play d6, so you gotta play d6 yourself. Knight f3. Do you remember when I told you that these top guys 95% of them keep an option of not taking on a6 immediately and uh, going with bishop f5, bishop a6, knight a6, even in some variations, rook a6, and just like Perunovic does, 
queen a5. The thing is, uh, Magnus Carlsen played against Gukesh. That game was played during COVID 2021 uh, on the chess 24. Uh, and let me just show you this one. Knight d2, bishop f5 is aimed against e4. So a very unusual way of taking diagonal by the light square bishop, which prevents white to go with e4. So after knight d2, uh, and the main point of knight d2 is just to go with e4 and to fight the light square bishop, uh, Magnus decided to capture on a6. After this guy went uh, for e4, Magnus first included bishop g4 to provoke f3, and afterwards he put the bishop back to c8. That bishop wants to go on the natural diagonal, but now in even better circumstances because he kind of forced white to play e4 because there are so many lines where they don't want to play e4, but they play some rook b1, b3, a4 in g3 lines. And now uh, when Gukesh played a3, and don't forget Gukesh just crossed 2750 and he became the top Indian player after Wishian and after 27 years. The kid is amazingly good. He's 17 years old and he's so, so, so good. Just remember his appearance in the Olympiad where he was absolutely the best competitor and he almost had like 8 out of 8, I believe, at some point. Anyways, Gukesh was white. Uh, the best in the history was black. That's Magnus. And Magnus played knight b4. Magnus now wants to go with knight d3 check, but also wants to play bishop a6. An interesting curiosity about Carlsen. Carlsen played a big number of games, Banco Gambit, which kind of surprised me. I didn't expect that uh, he would go for Banco Gambit himself. And I want to say even more surprising. I don't know if it's surprising or not, but he's having an amazing result uh, with the black piece. He's in the Banco Gambit. I believe we're not even aware how much uh, and how happy we should be for actually living in the era of that guy. So after knight b3, what Gukesh played here, and the idea was to defend that rook on a1, Magnus put the knight back on a6. Gukesh played short castle and Magnus, play, Magnus played knight to d7. It's a typical Abanko idea where you just open up the bishop on g7 and you just get a pretty nice control of the game there. The guy went for bishop to e3 and here Magnus uh, had so many options and uh, possibilities but Magnus opted for a queen b6. It is especially good to go with the queen b6 and rook b8 if the a3 is played. Uh, because simply b2 just turns out to be weaker, just like in this case, knight on b3. Gukesh went for rook b1, Magnus played knight c7, repositioning his knight back, going for some knight b5 ideas, uh, giving himself possibility to go with bishop a6 and playing rook fb8. After knight d2, he wants to go with the knight c4 here to harass the queen. M Magnus went bishop a6, preventing that playing rook f to b8, and let's be honest, if you really look at the moves by Magnus played in this game, you don't find them particularly difficult. But it was difficult to play knight move bishop f5, to take by knight, to play bishop g4, to jump on b4 and go back and then to decide to go knight c7, bishop a6. Just like you see, uh, when you watch simply games of these best guys, everything seems to be so easy. Here, Gukesh played bishop f1, Magnus captured, played queen a6. Here, I'd like to emphasize the importance of exchanging the queens in any kind of Banco positions. You're down a pawn, and now you, you should say, but we're not supposed to exchange queens, right? Because we're down a pawn. Well, in Banco, there are some other rules, of course. Every rule has its own exception. And here, we're just talking about uh, being fine with queen exchanges and end games or simplified positions in any kind of Banco position. So here Magnus captured on c3. When you capture on c3, golden rule is you do it for concrete reasons. Here he, he did it just to take the pawn on a3. Gukesh captured on b8. Magnus captured rook b8 as well. 
played c4, uh, Magnus jumped with the knight on e5. That's one of the things to, when you reposition the knight on e5. Penetrated with a rook on the second rank. Played knight d3, kicking the rook away. Played queen c3, pressuring the knight on d2. Took the pawn on c4. Uh, and it's very interesting how Gukesh easily collapsed in this game. Took on d5, took on e5. Magnus was three pawns up and Gukesh immediately resigned. What a fantastic and easy game by Magnus Kraus. Although, if you remember this position where he played bishop f5, I'll show you the game of our hero for this variation, uh, Grandmaster Perunovic. Uh, Perunovic played knight a6. He likes to capture with the knight. Capturing by knight gives you a pretty nice flexibility. You can go on f5 in some positions. You can go on a6. You don't necessarily have to take on a6 by bishop. You can go with knight on b4, just like we saw in Carlson's game, or you can put it back on c7. Sometimes that bishop can even go on b7. So you have, like, simply, um, let's, uh, let's make the long story short. You just play more flexible uh, positions with the, when you take the, with the knight on a6. So after castles, Peronovich played queen b6. So once again, that queen not always has to go on a5. And after... Uh, knight d2, where he just wants to go with the knight on c4. Uh, I just want to show you a couple of games. Lots of guys go with rook e1. You always reposition this knight to d7 to open the bishop on g7 in this diagonal, to open this knight, to go on e5 if possible. And you're, you'll go with knight b4, knight c7, and bishop a6. The thing is, if they ever go e4, all of a sudden, the biggest weakness becomes square d3. And then, what are you want to jump with a knight from d7 or knight from a6? One of these knights go on c5, and then this knight definitely wants to settle itself on d3 with an amazing pressure on the white game. So after knight d2, Perunovic played knight d7, knight c4, queen b4, threatening this knight on c4, knight e3, and put the knight back on c7. After a4, played rook b8, played bishop a6, and played a very strong move to claim compensation and to uh, make the things being very unclear. Uh, of course, if he'd captured, he would have captured, he can capture by both, by pawn and getting the c5 square for the knight and weakening d5, or even by bishop weakening the pawn on b2. Uh, queen c2, played c4 to play some knight c5, and played a very strong move, f5, to uh, bring the queen back to f6, so knight from c3 cannot harass that queen with the knight e4. After knight e1, played knight c5, brought a queen back to f6, played a very nice uh, knight b3 move to go to d4, reached the d4, a very lovely square in this position, had a great compensation, and soon after managed to win and defeat Mayorov in Portugal 2017. Just like you see, uh, when you play these positions well, you know how to claim compensation, you know how to simply uh, and smoothly, you know, like slide with your pieces over the board. I just told you that there are like two ways of trading this position, and we've seen how do we play if they go with g3. How do we play if they go with e4? I just have to uh, point out one thing. Whether they play e4, knight f3, you just go castle and that transposes into the e4 type of lines. So after e4, you go castles and here we once again have to stop and I gotta tell you that there are four important moves to cover here. First move that I'd like to show you here is seemingly a little bit weird, a7. I spoke to woman grandmaster Sandra Jukic and she told me she played a game where she played against a girl some a7 and she instantly knew she was prepped for her and she doesn't like this a7 move you don't have to panic it's nothing that's special you just capture and when they play knight f3 you have two kinds of playing uh, here you can play d6 but with a rook on a7 there are some other rules I I'd like to point out an importance of e6. 
e6 gives you a great compensation in these positions what's the point of e6 when you play e6 you just want to break the center you want to open a file and you give your opponent chance to play a position that is reminiscent of the Blumenfeld gambit so if they go and take on an e6 you recapture by pawn and afterwards go with d5 and afterwards go with knight c6 and play absolutely lovely type of the game that really reminds me a lot on Blumenfeld gambit so I believe that black has an amazing compensation and now we can even use this rook on a file if needed or it may go on f7 and go on the f file into the action on the king side they all go with bishop e2 where you capture here you once again have to know that that a7 even though they they just for example very confidently going for that a7 it's not the end of the world here you take on d5 and they have two options they can go e5 and they can go e takes d5 if they go e5 which turns out to be uh, maybe even more dangerous at first glance you go knight g4 and when they play bishop g5 you go queen e8 you go after the pawn on e5 and when they go castles you take on e5 they take on d5 and knight bc6 i found the correspondence game between two guys a guy with the black pieces was way higher rated and better player and he went chilly managed to win the game black absolutely looks fine in this position i'd say uh, that he's got a good counter chances and keep in mind we're not even down a pawn and there is no white center uh, which really gives us great opportunities after e takes d5 you just go d6 castles knight a6 and we come to a very important theoretical position here there are three moves here by white uh, typical maneuvering with knight e2 knight c4 is nothing because we play knight c7 uh, threatening d5 and when they go with the knight c4 we go with a rook e8 i'd like to get some space for my pieces by exchanging these knights with knight e4 i'd like to place my light square bishop on b7 pressuring the b7 pawn I'd also like to go with bishop a6 harassing that knight on c4. Another option is bishop f4 going for potentially weak d6 pawn, especially if they go with some knight d6. Oh, sorry, knight b5. You go knight c7, which prevents knight b5, and kind of makes some pressure against the d5 pawn, rook e1, and rook to b7. I found lots of games being played like this. I'm showing you a game between. Uh, Orkidal and uh, Jorhus from uh, Norway 2015 this guy played queen d2 and knight takes d5 it is especially important to be ready and to know and to be familiar with this p sack because when they play like this you just play rook to b2 bishop on g7 supports rook takes b2 threatens that queen and after queen d1 you're down a piece and now you're in second exchange so after that you get a, a piece back and after everything bishop d6 bishop b7 is a very important move rook e8 queen e8 we just reach objectively speaking equal position and uh right after that they were just playing like a pretty big and uh, long game but let's be honest i don't see how can white claim an advantage here um once again Orkidal against Jorhus from Norway 2015 they drew the game position is equal and finally let's check the most important and most dangerous move uh, that was done by Matthias Blubaum from Germany a uh, booked up guy uh, great theoretician who came up with this knight b5 couple of times threatens the rook and threatens the pawn potentially rook to d7 which kind of over protects the pawn on d6 but does something else it also weakens the bishop on c8 so after like bishop c4 bishop b7 i found out that all these guys went for queen to b3 an idea of queen to b3 is to connect the back rank these rooks and to release the d1 so he can over support the d5 pawn in case of some queen, f, uh, queen a8 in case of bishop g5 you just go with knight c7 take and you take by rook 
play queen a8 trying to go after the d5 pawn force them to take and you know what after bishop a6 the rook b7 rook f b8 i really believe that black has a very nice i'd call it compensation for the given pawn uh, but that bishop on f6 uh, has like a pretty big role in this game and uh, i believe that we absolutely don't have any problems with the black piece that's why white has to go with the queen v3 queen a8 rook to d1 and you go with the knight c7 by bringing your knight back to c7 you're swapping off this knight that comes uh, like a feeling of having a bone in your throat so after knight c7 rook c7 bishop f4 rook to d8 a4 bishop a6 uh, an idea of bishop a6 is not only to swap off these bishops but to also have an open b file possibly for rook or b7 or rook b8 so after knight d2 rook b7 i found a couple of games they went like this and you just equalize game without any problems very interesting lines very interesting ideas i showed you how should you play after eighth move a7 there is a crazy move e5 i'll reveal a secret to you i was analyzing this for white and trying to prove that i can play this with a white pieces and i realized that vastly so went for this in couple of his games an idea is to kick the knight away and then to go and to launch a crazy attack with h4 although before that those who just uh, go for a pawn mass with f4 you just break it with d6 and they have problems in the center knight f3 knight d7 once again they have problems in the center and when they push this pawn to e6 you just take on e6 and if they take like this you threaten the pawn they gotta defend it and probably because nobody of course d5 you just get a strong center and fantastic position for black black is much better probably you're all afraid of d5 because at first glance looks like uh, we can't play d5 believe it or not move is d5 fantastic idea and after 96 uh, they're absolutely shaky bishop is hanging pawn on a6 is hanging pawn on a6 can be taken whenever we want they don't have a possibility i mean king is still exposed in the center f4 uh, kind of blocks this bishop pawn on f4 makes it weaker for them i absolutely enjoy an amazing initiative with the black pieces and that's why they all go with the knight g5 you play knight f6 knight e6 take and play d5 Dubov played against Moisenko like this in European Championship in um, Jerusalem 2015 like many years ago but after bishop e2 knight c7 knight takes e6 and you just they made the draw but Moisenko offered him a draw uh, at that time he was 2700 Dubov playing black 2630 I guess he was okay with the draw against Moisenko with the black pieces but uh, why did I uh, bring up that story because i believe that in normal circumstances black should be playing on in this position and because black absolutely doesn't have any problems so after a5 knight e8 there's also a move knight f3 you once again challenge the center with d6 here they can't hold it if they take it you just take by knight which is very interesting because the bishop on d6 g7 is open knight on d6 uh, <coughs> blocks this passed pawn on d5 and after bishop e2 knight takes a6 bishop b7 put the knight on b4 or c7 and go after the pawn on d5 after bishop f4 knight d7 he takes knight takes bishop e2 bishop a6 takes on e2 and i told you when you decide to give up the bishop the dark square bishop for the knight you decided for concrete reasons he went for rook a4 a very lovely move that comes down with tempo threatening bishop on f4 and pawn on a2 and gives him some uh queen a5 or queen a8 afterwards after bishop d6 he takes queen b5 rook a3 found a game like this and all these pawns are about to fall in white's game eventually they drew that game after e5 98 I believe the most consequent continuation by white is h4 why h4 because you sack a pawn you don't care you kick the knight away you give yourself possibility to go h4 h5 for what for the pawns 
So after bishop h6, knight g7, knight f3 with tempo, and h5. I really have to tell you that white has an amazing score in this line. It's a little bit weird. King looks uh, kind of shaky on g8. Knight on g7 doesn't look uh, entirely good. Bishop on f6, usually it belongs on g7, but what can we do? I mean, it stands there. And here, you just go with the queen on b6. Believe it or not, according to the engine, uh, and since we have a possibility to take it by knight or by bishop, black is absolutely fine in this position with a very nice counter chances. But somehow, engines prefer a little bit more this for white. Although I have to remind you of one fact, not always, not, not, not that you, not always. I mean, don't ever do that. If the engine says it's plus one and you don't understand a single thing, don't play that. Rather play something that is, uh, I don't know, plus three for your opponent, but where you understand your ideas and you enjoy those positions. Then choosing the minus one for you and you absolutely don't know what to do. It's one of those difficult positions. Engines, for example, like for black, but I just have to tell you, it's a little bit difficult for playing. Although, let's be honest, also your opponent shouldn't be too familiar with all these tactical choices that he, he's got on the king's side. And after all, he's going to be down upon and he has to claim this compensation. We've seen uh, eight move e5, we've seen a7, and let me just show you a normal bishop e2. If bishop uh, e2, you just play queen a5, threatening to take on e4. They got to go bishop d2. And now you have an option of taking by bishop or taking by knight. In this situation, I'd simply go with bishop a6. And after e5, you just go with knight e8. Knight f3, since e5 pawn was hanging, and break it. Uh, if e takes d6, you take by pawn, take here, go with the knight d7, place knight on c7 place knight on b6, rook f to b8, and always, if you remember what I told you previously, offer them to trade the queens off with the queen a6. After e6, bishop e2, queen e2, once again the same idea, and I'm showing you a concrete game. e takes, rook takes, knight g5, traded the queens off, played rook f5, took on c3 to take on d5, sacked an exchange for winning two pawns for the bishop um, uh, two pawns and a bishop for, for the rook took everything and after this bishop e5, bishop f6, king f7, knight e c7 and this was a game between Sogard and Klangel and they drew it afterwards correspondence game absolutely fine from black's point of view we've seen e5, a7, bishop e2 let's go for the main line after knight f3, and that's literally what everybody does, uh, you just play queen a5. It's creation of Milos Perunovic. Uh, I remember when he told me about this move, uh, I, I was just, you know, like laughing, like what is so special about this one? I mean, you threaten uh, to take on e4, but there are like a pretty big number of tactical tricks behind queen a5 and what i like the most about this position you just choose the right moment and the right piece to capture on a6 so you keep the flexibility of taking on a6 by knight by bishop or in some situations uh, depending on circumstances you're gonna have some very nice tactics along the b file let's get started a famous game uh, between Gelfand and Carlsen went with the bishop d3 move. And I found so many games being played online, tournament games. And look at here, Gelfand in Zurich 2014 went against Carlsen like this. I found so many games like this by so many good players. Gelfand is one of the most solid players in the world. He went for the bishop d3 and blundered knight takes d5. It's so easy to blunder these tactics. Carlsen found it, of course, played bishop c3, and if bishop d2, he would have exchanged everything, and keep in mind, when he takes on a6, he's, he's not even up a pawn, but uh, three pawn islands, 
And uh, the fact that this is nothing else but an endgame, and endgames are good for Banco Gambit players, this just gives Black an amazing game. After B takes C3, Magnus went for Queen Swing C3, and now look at this. You can play Bishop D2 because the Bishop is Kangy. Uh, Rook is threatened on A1. Uh, king is under the check. So after queen d2, queen a1, castles. Here I found all these games, even between Carlsen and Gelfand was bishop a6, but according uh, to these top engines, you should be going with the queen g7. Hiding this queen, and when they playing bishop b2, playing f6. What is, what is the difference between that? Here, when you play bishop a6, bishop b2, you have problems with this queen. It's... Uh, objectively speaking problematic uh, rook a1 this one bishop e4 they can somehow claim some sort of compensation although carlson won his game uh, but if you like you can just bring the queen back to g7 uh, give yourself an easy time order a coffee and say okay uh, i'm up an exchange i'm gonna get a pawn on a6 i'm gonna even be uh, up a pawn exchange and a pawn up and this should be like a matter of technique and, you know, like in realization. Doesn't matter, I just showed you how should you play against queen a5, bishop d3. What happens if they play that uh, famous a7 idea that is always looking so dangerous? I gotta tell you a story. I was white. I played a game online. I played against some FM and he destroyed me with this. I'm showing you a game between Gukesh and Firuzia. Another a pretty short loss by Gukesh, uh, this time against Firuzia. Uh, Gukesh went for a7, Firuzia captured. Can you imagine? So with a7, you're forcing your opponent to take by queen, in which case you have some... First of all, you don't have knight e4 threats. And second thing, if you take by rook, bishop d2 gives them knight b5 with tempo, which is very annoying. Although an amazing piece sack where the knight takes e4 all of a sudden all your pieces except the knight go after the knight on c3 rook on a1 and king on e1 so after a takes rook takes all of a sudden take a look at all these black pieces and this game so after uh, queen c2 that is most common in practice you take on c3 and after bishop d2, queen a4 is the critical move. Queen e4, and black is just winning. Or if bishop d2, of course, you capture, and I believe that's what I did, and then boom, rook b2, and they immediately resigned. And I lost with the white pieces against Banco Gambit uh, in, in a blitz game in 12 moves. I mean, funny. If knight e2, they just go rook b2, and they're just collapsing. And finally, if they go with a bishop d3, Knight c3, queen d2, this is game between Gukesh and Firuzia, and Firuzia played rook a8. What a cool move. Placing the rook on a file to defend the queen, this guy cannot capture because of bishop c3. Knight is untouchable, so after this, uh, poor Gukesh, at that time, not now, uh, he just lost both of his games uh, within like 15 moves against Benko, against Carlsen, and against Firuzia. Uh, it was 2021. I believe that now it would be a little bit different situation. And now we just have to see, we've seen bishop d3, we've seen knight move a7, let's take a look at knight d2. That knight d2 uh, sounds like a pretty uh, logical idea because uh, it kind of safeguards the king and goes with this knight on c4. After bishop a6, bishop a6, I like to point out that any bishop a6 you always take by queen. It's always a very lovely possibility for black to take by queen. Why? Because when you take by queen, they can't make an easy short castle. They have problems with this queen, and we gotta force these guys to go with the queen e2. Yes, you always can exchange or let them take, and then you recapture probably by knight. Uh, or you can take by rook and go with d6, knight, bd7. But I, I like to once again emphasize one thing in these lectures. So you should be going with e6 to claim compensation in these positions. More about this, you can just uh, get it if you analyze it by yourself. But according to latest analysis, e6 
is something, you know, like a very trendy, cutting edge theoretical thing. And it's so good for black. After bishop e2, d6, castles, knight f2, d7. Quite interesting. Uh, an international master from my city, Jelko Jukic, played this back to 1996. And pr I was actually his teammate. And probably at that time, we weren't even uh, familiar how good this variation with delaying to take on a6 was. And how good was this knight f to d7? Uh, after he recaptured by knight, queen b4, knight e5, black just claims a huge compensation and the golden rule is once you offer them to trade the queens off, you probably equalize game without any problems. This was game between grandmasters Rajkovic and uh, Jukic. And finally, I gotta show you the final move. And the final move in this lecture is ninth move bishop d2. Most logical thing, probably he wants to go with some a7 now because if rook a7, knight b5 would win exchange. And here you just have to take it. You gotta take it because I insist he defended the pawn on e4, he wants to play um, a7, and you don't have time for a7 yourself because of that famous p sac 94. So after bishop d2, bishop a6, uh, if they take it, do I have to remind you? You capture by queen, you prevent castle, and on queen e2, d6, knight bd7 is absolutely normal thing followed by recap v8. But I once again want to claim a modern way of claiming compensation in these positions with e6. After d takes f6, f takes. Then you want to go with d5, then you want to place your knight on c6, and black has absolutely, absolutely nice compensation. And finally, if bishop e2, on bishop e2 you go d6, castles, bishop takes, queen takes, let's stop here. Knight is still on b8. Probably, automatically, most of you would play knight bd7. Don't do it. Because you now have a possibility for a queen a6 to challenge the queen on e2, to offer them an, um, an endgame. And I want to show you a fast game between Shankland and Perunovic. It was played online Belgrade 2014 between two universities and Shankland went rookie one. Perunovic traded off, played knight bd7. Uh, you're probably, uh, he wanted to go, if this one, he probably wanted to go with knight a6 and then this knight is looking for some compensation on the weak light squares. Although, after he offered, he, he wanted to tell him, okay, I'm willing to exchange, if you want to exchange. Perunovic played knight bd7, e5. You never let them break this pawn structure. Played knight g4 to open the bishop and go after e5. He takes, he takes. Bishop f4, knight e5, knight e5, knight e5. And I played uh, lots of games like this. For example, when I was younger, I drew against one fm like this with the black pieces. And at that time, I was okay with the draw. But now when I take a look at this position, I really like it for black. Uh, after knight b5, Perunovic played rook a6, Shankland captured, he went with the knight d3, threatening both of these bishops. Look at the great tactical uh, game by Perunovic. Bishop g3, played f5 to go after his bishop. Uh, knight b5, played f4, and after this, played g5. What an amazing way of fighting against pretty unhappily placed dark square bishop in the white's game. Bishop g5, rook g6, and all of a sudden, you can see his threats. He wants to go with f3. Shankland played bishop h4, f3, rook g2, and Perunovic played c4. He was down two pawns, but initiative was on his side. So after b2 was hanging, d5 was cut off, he wants to play rook f5. So after d6, king f7. An idea of king f7 is to move his bishop somewhere, for example, f6 or here, or even take and play double these rooks. The guy played rook g1, Perunovic played an amazing bishop f6, and after bishop f6, even uh, uh, nicer rook g8. I have to tell you something, it was a fast game. There were some mistakes uh, here and there, uh, but I like the way he was actually conducting his initiative. After rook g2, f takes, played knight f4, and this guy couldn't 
prevent uh, a checkmate on h3 or if he goes for something else he would go with the knight h3 and promote the g2 pawn this game took place in belgrade 2014 after queen e2 queen a6 good players always avoid to, to, to exchange the queens and once again i'm showing you a game between the professor uh, Tomashevsky from uh, Russia and Perunovic game was played in Doha 2014 Perunovic played knight bd7 queen c2 and rook f to b8 uh, they called him professor because he knows how to treat these systems uh, I like uh, very much Tomashevsky style of playing and for example in this game uh, he's familiar with the fact that the queens shouldn't be traded off and he repositioned his queen to c2 not to trade the queens off to over support t4 and to give support to the b2 pawn although perunovic came up with a very nice idea 98 going with this knight to c7 and now you're probably wondering when they play a4 how should you play with your knights he went with the knight on c7 played knight b6 to go with the knight c4 and when tomashevsky played b3 he now played queen c8 uh, brought the queen back all the way to c8 in order to go and to release the ac square for the knight a6 knight before after a5 knight d7 knight a6 knight before queen d8 just like you see perunovic sacrificed the pawn for keeping an amazing bishop they afterwards drew the game but i just have to say that i wouldn't complain to be black uh, after this lesson in a game like this Hope that you enjoyed the presentation of Perunovic variation against uh, D4C4 or in the Banco Gambit. Uh, hope that you like the lecture and let's see your interest. If you like it more, maybe we can carry on with this uh, Banco Gambit series. Thanks for watching and uh, like and subscribe. Bye bye.